We had to stop recording because the camera lost the autofocus. It seems to be back. So this was um, October 2023, Unit 5, run through. So uh, for those of you who saw the first part, um, it's in a separate video. So we're going to go on for from after the multiple choice, question 11 onwards. Okay. Um, just so again, the plea, please uh, continue to like, share and subscribe so we get higher up on the YouTube ranking through the algorithm. Okay, because we're getting quite a few people who want the videos made. Answer all questions. It says air is filled, air is used to inflate a balloon. The inflated balloon has a volume given in meters cubed and contains this number of particles. Um, the air inside the balloon exerts a pressure of this number of pascals. So everything's in SI units. The equation you've got to use is PV equals NKT. What are they asking? They want you to calculate the average kinetic energy uh, of the air molecules. So this is one equation. And this is the other equation that you have on the equation sheet. So it's uh, the mean kinetic energy. That's the root RMS squared value. Yeah. So the mean, the mean square speed not the RMS, the, the mean of the square speeds, okay, is equal to 3 halves of K times T. So the, both of these come from the formula sheet. So the mean kinetic energy, which is all of that, is going to be equal to, if you look at this, KT from here is PV over N. So KT is what we want. We haven't been given um, KT, but we know PV and N. So we've been given, obviously K we know, we haven't been given a T, so you can replace KT with P, V, and N. Um, so that means you don't have to, uh, it makes it a quicker calculation than rather multiplying, working out what T is, and then putting K in. So that reduces one bit of data entry. Okay, so pressure we know is here. Um, volume is given here, and N is uh, given here. So we know all three values and the average kinetic energy is 3 halves of kt, which equals 3 halves of pv over n, using the algebra I just explained. Put the numbers in, you get the answer in joules, and that to sit three, three significant figures is 5.93 to 2, you can round it up to 5.9. I always tell my students, do the three significant figures first, or however many you've done in your, in your first session, and then round it up to show that you shouldn't really go to that many. I think three significant figures would be okay in this question, but the examiner has given it as two, okay? Question, question 12 next, a student uh, investigate the relationship between pressure and volume. So continuing with the same topic of a fixed mass of gas at constant temperature. So we're talking about Boyle's law. These are controlled variables, the fixed mass, of gas at a constant temperature is Boyle's law. So again, the equation is PV equals NKT, where N is a, N is a number of um, uh, particles in the fixed mass of gas. K is the constant, and T is the constant temperature we're using at. So this is the isotherm. This is the constant temperature um, in the data. He used the data to plot the following graph. So that's Boyle's law. As you increase the pressure, the volume decreases. Yeah. So, the students say that this graph demonstrated the pressure exerted by the gas was inversely proportional to the volume of the occupied gas. Assess the validity uh, of the student's statement. Well, from this graph, the only way you can do that is to say, well, if P is proportional to 1 over V, PV must be a constant. And you could take 1, 2, and uh, the examiner's done three points. I think these are the examiner's points. So, if you put those values in and you do those calculations, you will see that this is what they're looking for. So if you've done two pairs of readings, you get one mark. If you do an additional pair, so three sets, to validate it, you get a second mark. And if you put the values, all of them correctly, um, with the right unit, never forget the unit in case the examiner takes a mark off for you. Again, my camera's gone fuzzy, so I might have to restart again. It's really annoying. I apologize for that. Okay, so hopefully you had time to look at the mark scheme before it went fuzzy, and you can go back and pause the video. Okay, so, oh, the, the, it's come back again. 
so it looks like it's temperamental. So it's question 12. I've shown you the mark scheme. It's only a four mark question, so basically you're, it's like a GCSE question um, in, to some extent. Question 13. So question 13. In the early part of the 20th century, Rutherford made the first observation of an element being changed into a different element. So alpha particles are fired at a nitrogen atom or nitrogen atoms. So momentum and mass energy must be conserved is my first thought. So I kind of put my thoughts down as I'm reading the question to pre predict, if you like, what the examiner is going to go into. The nuclear equation is given, it's balanced already, but you've got to calculate the minimum energy in mega electron volts. Um, they're giving you mass, okay, required for the reaction to take place. Yeah? The minimum energy would could be called the activation energy for the energy for this to take place, because obviously um, an alpha particle is positive, nucleus of helium. And this nucleus, uh, it, if it's going to fuse, it needs to get to the nucleus. So it's got to approach it at a distance approximately in the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters, which is the nucleus size. So you're given these, these values. So you've got to see that at the beginning, those two masses, which was helium and nitrogen. So you add these two masses together. That's how much mass you had initially. Then add the masses that you're left with afterwards, which is the oxygen 17 and the hydrogen. Okay, so when you add those masses, you before and after, you'll see this is the mass initially in kilograms. Don't forget to put that. I had a student who just forgot to multiply it by the value given in the table, which is all the order of these particles is 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And each unit of mass, um, so for example, helium would be four units of mass is about 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27. That's approximate. So when you have the, the, the actual values, so you're giving it to two, four, five decimal places, then you can use the mass difference before and after. So you do the same after, work out, and they're not exactly the same. This was 88942, this is 89. So after the mass went up, that means you've got to put the energy in to create this new mass. So once again, it looks like the... Um, video is losing focus. Let's see if I just put it back in, whether it auto focuses or not. Okay, so before I put the mark scheme in, so let's see if the mark scheme does anything to the autofocus. I have complained to the manufacturer and they admit that there must be a fault and they said I could return it, but it's actually been working since it happened initially. Okay, so there's the mark scheme. Um, Hopefully you can see it. Let's take it out again. That's question 13. So once you've worked out the mass difference, the mass increases, so that means you've got to put the extra energy in E equals mc squared uh, to, work, to, get, to get this extra energy, which is to 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. So it's the difference between the two values I've shown you to 2.07. So I'm going to continue with this. Hopefully it'll come back. Okay. Then the energy required is using E equals change in mass or the increase in mass by the C squared, which is Einstein's equation, relativity. So the difference in mass multiplied by C squared, which is 9 times 10 to the 16, gives you an answer in joules. But you remember, the question is asking for you to do it in mega electron volts. So you basically divide this value by the charge of one electron, which is the electron volt value, and you can then see how many electron volts it is. So you divide by 10 to the minus 19, and you see it's 1.16, some 10 to the 6 electron volts, which is 1.16 mega electron volts to three significant figures. Yet again, uh, the examiner has given it, I think, to two significant figures. So you can round it up to two significant figures as well. So I always put both, just so I'm hedging my bets. Yeah. So to keep going, hopefully the... Um, focus will come back. It says explain why. You've presumably got this in front of you, the paper. Explain why alpha particles must have an energy greater than the minimum energy um, for the reaction to take place. Well, remember the alpha particles were coming in to collide with the nitrogen, so they came in with some momentum initially. So that momentum will continue afterwards and take away some of the energy. In effect, this is a collision, I've written, and as such, momentum must be conserved. And as the alpha particle must have had momentum initially, the products must have 
an equivalent a momentum afterwards. So there must be some kinetic energy remaining in the products, which means that um, the alpha particle must have an energy greater than the minimum energy required that we calculated here because some of the energy will go into the kinetic energy of the products rather than in just making the mass. Okay, so let me see if I can play around with the lighting and see if that does anything. Okay, it's rather annoying, I do admit it. There is an autofocus button, but I've never managed to get it to work. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause again and start again at question 14. Apologies once again. Hopefully it will uh, work next time. Okay, so um, see you in the next video. Bye for now.